And I remember waking up in the morning and there's the VA police there and another, like a sheriff. And the doctor sitting there and he's like, look, we can't have this here. I'm like, what do you mean? We can't have this here and you're gonna go to jail. My name is Travis Story. I served in the army from 2006 to 2012. I uh, got out as KFC. I was a 15 Tago Blackhawk uh, repair and crew chief. I'm from Villa Park, California. My uh, childhood upbringing was pretty, pretty good. But at the same time, um, my dad he came to this country uh, when he was three. So he had kind of like this old school European mentality. Um, you have to earn for like, you have to earn everything uh, that you work for. You know? um, so even though we lived in a really good neighborhood, um, we still had to work. We still had to help out with the family business. Um, I mean, even like when we're playing video games and there's like construction workers working on the house, he would make us go outside and help, like help them learn how to do like masonry or what have you, you know? Yeah. Um, but also, um, I'm the youngest of five boys. So he had always told me, you know, when he turned 18, he get Samsonite luggage and it was kind of like an ongoing like joke in a way, but it was actually real. Um, so when... I was about 17 years old. He kept on asking me, you know, what are you going to do when you turn 18? Um, what are your plans? Um, college was obviously out of the question. My birthday's in December. So I ended up going to a continuation school, doing the work I needed to do and graduated half a year early. Wow. And uh, around when December came around and it was my birthday, I really didn't know what I was going to do. Yeah, you know. Um, luckily an army recruiter called me and asked me, Hey, what are you going to do? You know, yeah. how do you, do you plan on, uh, you know, joining the army or you want to, you know, you have any aspirations of like, you know, learning something new or, you know, adventure, you know, any adventure or anything. I'm like, yeah, man, hell yeah. And I was like, I'll, I'll be there right now. He's like, well, no, actually we're going to close up right now. I was like, no, you called me. I'm going to be down there like ASAP because <laughs> like I needed, I needed, needed a place to go, you know? Yeah. So I actually drove to the recruiter's office and they were closing up, but the recruiter who called me, uh, he wasn't there, but the commander of the, of the recruiting, uh, the recruiting station, uh, he took me in and he just started doing my paperwork right then and there. Wow. Really? Yeah. And then the following days, you know, um, I needed to get some paperwork from the high school showing that, Hey, you know, I'm going to graduate on this day in January. Mm -hmm. And so I got all the paperwork needed and December 13th, I signed up. Uh, the delayed entry program. My birthday was December 9th. Wow. I graduated uh, January, I think, 21st, and then left for basic training February 16th. Wow. So before that recruiter called you, have you been contemplating joining the military? Yeah, I'd been talking to my two oldest uh, half-brothers. Uh -huh. uh, one was in the Air Force and one was in the Army. Okay. And uh, I talked to my brother in the Army, it was in the army. I asked him like, "Hey, what service should I go into?" And being an army guy, he's like, "He should probably go in the air force." I talked to my air force brother. He's like, "Hey, you know, the air force is a pretty good deal. You know, I'll go to the air force." Yeah, but I didn't listen, and I ended up on in the in the army. I loved it. Um, it was something new. Um, they gave me a rifle. <laughs> you know, I got to shoot things, and like it was just new. It was exciting, and I really enjoyed it. It was better than being at home and you know, dealing with school and everything else. And I was all for it. Yeah. You know, I couldn't, couldn't wait to leave. I went to uh, Fort Eustis, Virginia, uh -huh. the training. I mean, they learned, learn how to work on, you know, taking off like major components, like, you know, wheels, brakes, learning how to work on, um, uh, take off, you know, rotor blades, what have you, mm. you know, just like basic maintenance stuff. And, and not until like later on, we started getting into like the nitty gritty uh, when he got into the units, you know, it's just kind of like the base of knowledge that they taught us, you know, learning how to use um, special tools like torque wrenches and whatnot that are used on the aircraft. So, I mean, I was I was pretty scared uh, going to a different country. Um, at that time, Kim Jong-il was launching like nukes in the ocean and there was a lot of tension and stuff. So like being 18, I'm like scared and going into the unknown, you know. And I remember just getting to Camp Stanley uh, they had like a uh, kind of like an internet cafe type deal, and uh, I'm going to like write an email to my my parents and let them know, hey, I made it okay. And I remember feeling like an earthquake, power going off, and then hearing a siren, and I was like scared shitless. And within a couple hours, you know, the siren went off and like everything was good, but that right there kind of like scared me. But that wasn't like 
the rest of the, the experience there. Mm-hmm. Um, I ended up being stationed at K-16 Air Base, which is uh, southeast of Seoul. It's a Korean air base. Okay. Um, that the U.S. shares with uh, the South Korean mm-hmm. Air Force. Um, it was pretty cool because it, it was a small attachment of like 15 guys. And there was no MPs there. Um, even though we had a curfew, uh, we didn't really abide by it. And it was a fun experience. We, we would go out to the bars late at night. You know, yeah. we were told to stay away from the places that had these barber pools, old school barber pools that would spin, you know? And we noticed the more barber pools that are stuck together, the nicer of a place it is. Yeah. The place was a massage parlor. And at times we would go to those massage parlors, you know, uh, after drinking and whatnot. And then if we can, you know, get laid or any of that, we could <laughs> end up just going there, you know? Yeah. Because sometimes it's, it's hard breaking through that language barrier. You can't. You can't do it with like hand signals and whatnot, you know? Yeah. Uh, it was, it was a really good time, really good for camaraderie and, and meeting a lot of really good people there. There was a place in Seoul, uh, where a lady would take ping pong balls yeah, and, uh, shove her, shove them inside of herself and then shoot them out. You know, it was a pretty crazy experience being 18 years old, being out in Korea and, uh, I mean, I'm being mentored by a lot of older people as well, you know, been in service for quite a while. Um, and being in this detachment, there was, I mean, there was about 15 of us. Our platoon leader was a chief warrant officer too. Uh, platoon leader was an E7. And it was kind of cool. Cause like, we're kind of like a tight knit group and we would go out and drink. And remember one time we would go to like the classics and we picked up a keg and drug it back to, uh, the Sergeant G's, uh, apartment. And we're just drinking and drinking and like one, eight, we're like all of us tapped the keg, you know, and this is like a. 1 30, 2 a.m. in the morning. And in Korea, they used to do these like drills where like they would, at like 1 a.m. in the morning, they call the platoon sergeant or, you know, the platoon leader, platoon leader, you know, get a hold of the platoon sergeant and we have to be out full battle rattle, certain, you know, level of mop gear, what have you. Mm-hmm. But this happened and I just remember, you know, like days and fucked up and he's like answering the phone. Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, no problem. I'll let, let you know the accountability here soon. And like 30 minutes go by and he calls him back. Yeah, we're a hundred percent. We're ready to go, but we're not in full battle rattle. Like we're barely clinging to life, like hung over, you know, passed out all throughout his apartment. No, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was, it was a good time, but we also uh, handled business. What, you know, when needed, when needed to be like, as long as we handled work when, when it needed to be, when we, did our PT, pass our PT tests, and just handled everything what needed to be done. Yeah. We'd be able to have fun. And it was very cut and dry, no like garrison bullshit. You know, it was just like, look, do your job, make sure, you know, you're working out, staying in shape and doing what you have to do. And if you didn't, guess what? You know, we're doing PT, we're doing our, you know, we're doing our thing. Oh. So everyone was, we all knew. You guys didn't get up to PT together? No, we, we did, but sometimes like, we would all hang out the night before be like still drunk and be swaying and stuff. So he'd be yeah. like, all right, go back and do barracks maintenance. Meaning like go back to your room, sober up, yeah, drink some water, eat some food and come back down and we'll be able to like handle some work, you know? Right. And we would make it up, make it up one way or another throughout the week. You know, mm-hmm. what was your, uh, what was your favorite part about, uh, Korea? Um, I really like history. Mm-hmm. So going to see like the Korean war museum and, and seeing like some of the architecture and everything else. Like I really enjoy the Korean war museum because like you see stuff from way uh, from a long time ago, mm-hmm. you know, like, like 1500s, you see like, like old school, they're like old school rocket launchers. There are like these spears in these, uh, square boxes with other squares inside of them with fireworks hooked onto it. So like they would light these gnarly fireworks attached to spears and they just launch. Dang. Or these ships that would look like turtle shell, shells, like Bowser shell, but with spikes. Uh huh. So when people would jump on top, they would get impaled. And oh shit! And they had this uh, memorial where it showed every country, uh, every country serviceman that participated, you know, um, in the Korean War, and uh, who who had, you know, part of the fallen. They had a whole wall kind of like the Vietnam uh, War Memorial. Wow, which is really 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 nice to see oh you know it's sobering but it was nice to see like you know the respect and the love they had you know for other nations that came you know and answered the call yeah wow how much time did you spend there in korea i uh, just one year one year one year and then i ended up um going to uh fort campbell kentucky okay 
uh, with the 101st Airborne Division. Oh, nice. And and well, did you just change units, or how did that work? I just PCS'd. Oh, okay. I uh, went from 2ID, 2ID to uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and uh, they had me go to uh, 7th Battalion, 101st Airborne Division. Mm. And what was that like? Definitely, definitely different than Korea. Yeah. Um, it was more rigid. Um, you have a unit that deploys like year on, year off, you know, deployments. So going from a unit that, you know, was partying a lot and handling business, there was a lot more rigid uh, rigidity to it, you know? Yeah. But it was nice because, you know, definitely needed that. And I had uh, plenty of opportunity to go to different schools, you know? What kind of school did you go to? Um, I did combatos. You know, I really enjoyed that because that was something I did growing up was um, I started wrestling around sixth grade. Mm -hmm. And that's something I was really passionate about and picked up like right away. And it was really nice being able to teach others, other people within the unit of like different ways of like different moves and different stances and everything else. When did you go over to Afghanistan? 2008 to 2009. Talk to me about that, man. What was, what was that like for you? It was very different. Uh, I remember like the first night, uh, we got there, uh, we got mortared, but the thing is like after the first couple of nights, you know, first couple of times that happened, um, pretty much got used to it. You know, it's just like a daily thing. I mean, if it came in at night, I just pretty much roll over just the way it is, you know? Yeah. And it really affected me. It was being, not being able to see my friends that would go out and they would take an RPG and they would get seriously injured not being able to see them again. Um, one of them I was actually able to see again when I came back to Fort Campbell. Um, he was on a schnook and he was on the ramp, took a RPG and peppered up up the side with shrapnel. And his name was Yazi. But I was like really concerned because he was a really, really nice guy and being able to see him. Like I remember just walking to the hangar and seeing him and just a big bright smile. Yeah. And like a, like a sigh of relief, you know, just to see him like walking around and stuff because just hearing what happened, you're like, holy shit, like, there's no way in Holly's like going to walk away from it, you know? Yeah. And during that time, you know, I, I ended up getting married when I was 21, young, dumb. Um, I made a decision. I loved her. Um, and as time went on, it was like, it was a huge struggle, you know, to kind of keep it going because she, uh, she obviously wants to see me and whatnot and come to find out she had been cheating. And I kind of took it on myself because it's like, damn, you know, if I wasn't gone so long and gone so much, you know, maybe we can, you know, work things out, you know. And I kind of took that on on myself. And in, instead of like looking at the depression, I ended up just finding other things to do and picking up other assignments, you know, like, um, again, the movement stuff. I ended up doing like all the hazmat stuff for pretty much the whole battalion, all the aircraft, all the containers. Um, and just trying to drown myself with work. What was communication like out there? Did you guys, did you have phones to be able to call at this time or? I mean, I, I got one and it was like a hundred dollars for like 90 minutes or some shit. Yeah. And I was like, there's no way I, I could afford this. So I just used like Yahoo voice, right. which was like one cent a minute, you know, over, you know, over, uh, internet. Yeah. But I mean, it, there's not much you could do over the phone, you know, cause there's no feeling there. There's no. You're not like really face to face. So it's kind of hard to really hash things out without being like uh face to face, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know? And being while well, like I'm seeing aircraft coming back with like, you know, intestine in them and stuff like that, like that light pink color that's like you see on your inner lip mm -hmm. and just knowing it came from one of your friends. You yeah. Know, you're like, man, this is fucked up. And like just feeling like, damn, I want to do something, but I can't. Right. I can't. Right. You know? And it's almost like a feeling of it's like a, like a helpless, helpless feeling. And while I was in Afghanistan, um, the retention NCO hit me up, you know, and I would mess with them a little bit. Uh, so he'd come to me and be like, Hey, you know, you're, you're around your time to be able to reenlist. Have you thought about doing something else? Or, you know, do you want to go somewhere, you know, a different duty station and stuff? It's like, well, and I would mess with them and be like, Hey man, I want to be like a train conductor. And he, he looked that up yeah. just messing with them. Hey, come back. They're like, no, that's only for like national guard or reservists. It's like, okay. And I'd be a boat driver, and I, I was doing this for like a week, you know, yeah. just messing with them. Finally, he's like, "Look, I can get you a duty, like a duty station." Um, big, and I had the choice between um, Fort Irwin and Fort Bellevue, Virginia. And being from California, I was like, oh, "Okay, I'll do Fort Irwin." 
So I re-enlisted and I, I re-enlisted to go to Fort Irwin, but I was going to PCS in February. But we were getting back from Afghanistan uh, on December 13th. And I got back and it was weird because um, I was working so much and just pretty much trying to suppress all these feelings, all these thoughts and everything. It's like my life went from 100 miles an hour and hit a fucking wall. You know, and I come back, I'm talking to my wife and she's just like, you seem like a completely different person, you know, and we're talking. And somewhere through all our conversation and argument, she's like, well, look, you're the one who signed up. So it's your fault. You're dealing with this. These are essentially your problem, not my problem. And I shouldn't be dealing with this. This is not something I signed up for. Mm -hmm. This is your problem. And so from then on, I'm pretty much like, you know, maybe it is, maybe it is. But we got back December 13th, December 23rd, I was hospitalized for su suicidal ideation. While you're still enlisted in the so, army. Yeah. And how'd that come about? Um, cause I started drinking when I get really depressed, mm -hmm. you know, I can't like smoke weed or do anything like that, you know? Um, right. So I just would drink and drink heavily and eventually, uh, she called and said like, you know, my husband, you know, has thoughts of fucking kept, you know, committing suicide, you know, I just like get away from me. And I ended up, uh, not hospitalized, well in a way hospitalized because they ended up just having me there and a good friend of mine, Sergeant Skeens, he, uh, showed up, picked me up and took me to his house, you know, and, uh, hung out there and we just talked about things and he had been through a lot of stuff himself. You know, I mean, there's nothing, you know, I didn't go through anything special, you know, like he did, but like he, he was very familiar with the feelings and was there for me, you know? It was a good feeling to know that like, you know, my brothers had my back, which is really, really nice. Mm -hmm. But the thing is I was, I was PCSing and going to uh, Fort Irwin. So that would be short lived and I would have to start all over again. And fast forward, I left February, left in February, went to Fort Irwin thinking, oh, cool, I'm going to be able to fly. I'm going to be, you know, in a flying type unit, you know, like it's going to be nice, you know, but I showed up and they ended up putting me into a clerical job. I had no idea what I was doing or any of that. And I was like, well, this is not my MOS. They're like, well, you're in the army. We can put you in essentially anywhere and you can be trained, you know? So after doing that for about like five months, I found an opportunity to be able to be stationed at Barcelona airfield with uh, NTC aviation company. King. And so I went there and at the time I had an apartment in Barso that was costing about $1,200 a month, trying to make things work. Still things not working. You know, she's still talking to the guy she was cheating me on, cheating on me with. And, uh, she ended up leaving. So I'm trying to pay for this apartment and then she ended up calling IG and then I had to give her 80% of my BAH. Mm. And at the time, um, I was an NCO. And I, I still couldn't afford the apartment. And eventually I got evicted. And I had to move all my stuff out. And I brought it to, well, I brought it to, I guess my dad's uh, office area, you know, where I could put like you know, some furniture and stuff like that, where I could store it. And uh, I was living in my car off of Outlet Center Drive off the of 15. And I kept my clothes in a wall locker inside the hangar, because inside the hangar, they had showers, they had wall lockers, bathroom. Um, on the second floor, they had like a little workout area and a place where you could sleep, because mm -hmm. they would also do like medevac out there and different stuff as well. Um, so as time went on, you know, I'm, I'm able, I'm in the Huey platoon, you know, being able, learning how to crew and everything else, and I'm, I'm still dealing with like these mental issues, dealing with a failing marriage and trying to make things work as I, you know, I love and everything else, but trying to reach on like the last nor I guess normal thing. The last thing I thought was normal, but it, it wasn't, you know, I'm just holding on to an anchor that's plummeting to the bottom of the ocean, not willing to let go, you know, mm. but at the time I'm like financially unstable. I'm just trying to make things work, but I can't. And then eventually I got on medications. And in the moment I got on medications, I was on lithium and Prozac. I was unable, to, uh, unable to fly. So the, uh, company commander, his name was major Reimold, I believe. And he ended up having me like 
you know, buff and wax floors, weed wax stuff outside, normal stuff that you give to, I mean, stuff you give to guys who you get like an article 15 and they have to do, you know, so many days uh, of, of this kind of work, you know? Yeah. And if I, if, essentially I felt like I was being casted, casted aside, you know, like I'm willing to do at that point, like, you know, office work, you know, whatever, except like stuff making me feel like I'm nothing, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, I, at the time, you know, I was doing college. I had 32 college credits. I uh, had been doing like different schools and just trying to do what I can to progress in the military, you know? And at the time, it's not like I can go home because my parents had lost their house in 2008. My dad had an office area. He was renting out to four families, you know, just trying to get rent money just to like retain a property for him to stay, mm -hmm. you know? And I really essentially had nowhere to go until um, I met CEO by the name of Branda. Um, he stepped up and helped me out and he's like, look, you need to stay with me and my family. And we, we grew close, you know? And like when I was dealing with mental stuff, he'd be like, fuck her. This is wild, man. So all this is going on while you're enlisted in the army. Yeah. Like, wow. This isn't like you got out of the arm. You know, most of the time I'm hearing stories like this, you know, people are, have gotten out, you know, they, they've transitioned out of military service and they're struggling like this, but you're going through all this as you're enlisted in the fucking army. Uh, well, here's the issue. They said because I was getting BAH, they couldn't put me in the barracks. But the thing is, I'm not getting most of the BAH. It's going to my wife, and I can't afford an apartment. Right. You know, I had just been evicted from it. Like, I had legitimately nowhere to stay. Like, I'm keeping my clothes in a wall locker, showering inside the hangar. He evicted you? No, I had been evicted. She had left. Oh. And I, the only place I had to stay was the apartment. Mm. And then I'm unable to pay the $1,200 a month, plus like drive to work or drive to Fort Irwin, which is like 40 something miles from Barstow. So I have to think about gas, going to and from, and, and everything else, you know? You couldn't, get, you couldn't ask them to stop the BAH so you could get housed on base? No, because then I would have to be divorced. Wow. And then they are like, well, we can get you a spot. And it's like at Yermo Annex. It essentially it was like a room with no like windows or anything there's probably only like 10 people there on and off like a day shift and night shift you know for like unloading some of like the the trains yeah i'm not too sure what the exact job that they were doing but like just being there like essentially i'm in a room alone dealing with like mental issues and there's like nobody around like you know fucking just pressing a shit so like i opted just to stay with Miranda. at least i was with somebody where i could like bounce my thoughts off of and everything else you know yeah so yeah, as the time went on, um, uh, Brenda ended up leaving and I ended up after my extra duty, I was like, well, I'm going to take, you know, I'm going to take some, take some time or not extra duty, but after like the stuff that they're making me do, um, I'm going to take some time for myself and then took two weeks off of leave. And for about the first week, you know, I'm just, just drinking, being an idiot, just trying to drown my thoughts and everything else and finally like i come to a point where like my mom stepped up and was like look you need to get some fucking help you know like the son i knew is no longer there and like you like the happy kid that i knew you're you're gone like it's gone like i can't my look in your eyes you're no longer there like so i went to the long beach va it was like august 11th and uh i admitted myself in the l1 the uh psych ward and I went over my leave stay. I didn't tell my unit where I was going or any of that. Because while I was at Fort Irwin, I would actually go to the hospital and feel, and let them know, like, I, I feel like doing myself in. Like, I, I fucking want to kill myself, you know? Like, even the drugs you're giving me, like, the medications, like, I just feel tired mm -hmm. and just out of it. I just still, like, in my soul, I feel like, like something's wrong. Like, I'm just sad. I don't know what the fuck to do. Yeah. You know, they're like, sorry, we don't have like those capabilities here. You have like an outpatient service, but we don't have like an inpatient. Only way to get inpatient is if it gets approved by the company commander and you'd have to go down to San Diego. Mm. So after dealing with that, I was like, fuck it, I'm going to go and leave and just try to figure things out. You know, the way I at the time I was doing it, I was just fucking drinking, you know, yeah. being an idiot. And uh, finally, my mom was one and just fucking. So you go to the VA to get help. Yeah, and went over my leave stay. So they ended up picking me up after two weeks of me being there and uh, brought me back. So anyways, I'm being read Article 15, and I just fucking snapped. I just snapped, you know? I'm, like, standing there 
You're back at your unit now. Back at my unit. And I'm just standing there. And then I told him, like, you guys preach about suicide awareness, you know, don't kill yourself. You know, one suicide is one too many, you know, the whole damn quote. But you guys, I felt like I was being penalized. Like, damn near every portion of the way I got on medications. And then, I, you know, I'm having to, like, you know, buff floors and do all this other stupid shit, you know, mm-hmm. like someone of a, on extra duty would do. You know, all the way until, yeah. you know, going to the hospital and getting a fucking Article 15 for being AWOL. So I'm standing there. And finally, I just lose my shit and up and tell them, like, look, this is bullshit. You guys are obviously fucking lying about trying to help soldiers like myself when it comes to suicide. And told them, like, look, obviously, you guys want me out. But when I get out, you know, this, I'm going to go fuck I'm going to find your wives and I'm going to fuck them. There's no way, nothing you could do about it. And I just, like, said all kinds of shit. I could pretty much, like, pretty much blacked out, said a lot of stupid shit I shouldn't have. Oh, wow. So I got two Article 15s right there. Oh yeah, that that no statements didn't help you. That's for sure. No, no military bearing. I just hit that fucking threshold. I was oh. just done, and uh, I went from E five to E three. Oh, and uh, got out on patterns and misconduct, and got out on a general with honorable discharge. Mm. Man, so I got out. Right, I had nowhere else to go, and then I ended up staying at the village as a Cabrillo in uh, Long Beach, mm-hmm. off of uh, Santa Fe and PCH, right next to Wilmington. You know, what? not a bad program. I mean, if you really have absolutely no, nothing or nowhere to go, it's not like the best program, but it was somewhere, yeah. you know, and being surrounded by vets. And I put in for, like, the VA disability and stuff. And one of the guys there, he mentioned about, look, have you thought about just volunteering? So I ended up volunteering at the VA. And it, I was just pushing people down around in wheelchairs or just telling them, hey, this is where this is or this is where that's at, you know. And I ended up getting a VA compensation uh, and after, I was like, six months. So I ended up leaving. And uh, so you got raided. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Or was it for PTSD or? PTSD with major depressive disorder. Okay. And uh, at the time, I ended up just moving in. My parent, my mom had nowhere to stay. My dad had a little, little bit of money, and we ended up, you know, renting a house and and being there, Dang. and staying with them. And I was continually going to the VA uh, for help, and they started started off slow with medications. You know, like I was at Epropion and Depakote, and was it Prazosin they were giving me. And I'd come back, be like, hey, I'm having this issue, you know, like I'm having really vivid nightmares. I mean, I'm having like re- weird dreams, you know, or like I just feel tired or nauseous or like, well, this medication would be that, you know, so we're going to add this, and, you know, on top of it. And after about like six months, I'm on like 13 different medications. I feel like, you know, all these needles in my back, you know, from my kidneys and everything uh, from taking all this, pounding a lot of water. And I'm trying to get like uh, actual therapy. And I'm going to therapy and they're opening up all these wounds and they're like, all right, we'll see you in about three weeks to a month, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's not like you can get like continual therapy weekly. And I gave, you know, sobriety a chance. I mean, it's not, it wasn't long, you know, short lived after six months thinking like, okay, you know, these pills are going to work like wonders and everything else. I'm going to be okay. But all I felt was tired and dragging my feet. And just feeling fucked up most of the time, yeah. you know? And I'm still feeling like, you know, the sadness, constant sad, you know, feeling like I just fucking threw my whole life away. I did, went from like doing really well to just a complete shit bag. You know, I failed this marriage. I failed my life. I failed myself. I failed my family. All these thoughts just running through my head of how much I'm just a fucking failure, you know? And it got to the point, you know, I just started drinking again, stopped doing all, some of the medications and stuff, and I'm just playing this fucking med and drinking game back and forth or no meds and drinking and, you know, or a little bit of drugs here and there and just fucking just doing what I could, you know, just maybe this will feel better. But it just all, all of it was just, at the end of, at the, at the end of it, I still feel the same, right. you know? How many medications did the VA have you on at, you know, what's the most, uh, it was about 12 or 13 in total pills a day, probably close to 30. And it got to a point where, like, I felt like the, I was getting, like, just fucked around by the VA, you know? Like, I'm going to a therapist, and they just open up these wounds, and 
they would never sew them back up. You know, like, hey, this is how uh, you should try doing X, Y, and Z to combat, you know, these feelings. Mm -hmm. You know, instead they just open it up and be like, well, all right, I will schedule you, you know, get with the scheduler and see the next time I can, you know, we get be together, mm -hmm. you know? And at the time it's like between three, three weeks to like a month and a half. So in between that yeah. time, what the hell do I do? Right. You know, and I'm calling them all these medications and I'm just going up and down, up and down mentally. And I got to the point, like I'm kept on telling my parents, like, I feel like the VA is just fucking me, man. The VA is just fucking me. Mm -hmm. So I ended up, I ended up just getting saying, fuck it, man, fuck it. And, uh, I grabbed a bottle of, uh, Kingsford lighter, lighter fluid and started trying to spray it on myself. Oh, and, uh, my brother, fucking grabbed me, you know, and told me like, look, you know, you're not fucking doing this. And like pulled the lighter out of my hands, pulled it, you know, the fucking and lighter fluid out of my hands. And he, he, my brother's a big guy. He's like six, seven, two sixty. you know what I mean? Wow. And like to fucking help me, you know, like I was just freaking out. I was like, no, no, no. Like I just wanted to fucking feel pain, just fucking like physical pain, not to feel the pain. I was like feeling inside. Cause I just feel like I just fucking felt my life, everybody, you know? So I ended up, my mom and my aunt ended up driving me to the VA. They're like, and I kept on fucking saying, like, they're screwing me over. They're like, don't worry, you'll be okay. Don't worry, you'll be okay. Go to the Long Beach VA. You check in, check into uh, their emergency room. They're like, don't worry, everything's going to be fine. We're going to take care of your son. Everything's going to be okay. So they brought me in the back, had me change my clothes, and I'm waiting in the back for like seven hours, man, like seven hours. And the doctor at the time, he comes to me and goes, sorry, we don't have room here for you. It's like, what do you mean? There's no room here. It's like, no, we don't have like, you know, any more room in, in L1 or, you know, any spot here. It's like, well, what are you going to do? And he just looks, you know, turns around, looks back, goes, I don't know. And I panic set in. I was like, fuck, man. Like, they don't even know what to do. Yeah. Like, what the fuck do I do? And I just wanted fucking help, man. So they had like the magnetic doors and I just ran and I bum rushed out and got them open and I started running. Um, ran across the parking lot, straight across, thinking maybe at the car wash or right up vertically across at the gas station, there would possibly be a, like a pay phone or something like that where I can call like my mom or brother or somebody to take me to like, you know, a little company of Mary or some, some other fucking place. Mm -hmm. But instead, the VA police chased me down um, and... I'm running into the car wash and they pull in and they ended up nicking me on the front uh, passenger side fender mm -hmm. and ended up on the ground. The, uh, one of the police officers on the passenger side of the car got out, put his knee on my back, put me in handcuffs, brought me back. And I told him, get your hands off me, get your fucking hands off me. You know, and he's like shaking me around and shit, you know, get your fucking hands off me. I'll kill you. Mm -hmm. And I was just in a manic state. I just wanted fucking help. That's all I wanted. You know, like. I don't want to be on these medications. Anyways, they shot me up with like whatever it was. I think it was hell at all. And I remember waking up in the morning and there's the VA police there and another, like a sheriff. And the doctor sitting there and he's like, look, we can't have this here. I said, what do you mean? We can't have this here and you're going to go to jail. Mm. So they sent me to Alley County jail and I'm detoxing off the of medications and like up and down, like I'm in jail. I'm fucking crying. Don't know what the fuck to do. Like I'm more scared, not about like the environment. I'm just scared about like my life is fucked. Like I'm in jail and these guys are saying like, I had like terroristic threats against the police officers. Like as if I went there to like shoot up the place or kill a bunch of people. I went there for fucking help. And I'm just scared, man. And, you know, like my life is done. Um, so I was there for about eight months. In jail? Yeah. For eight, eight fucking months? Yeah, and I was facing, I think it was between 15 to 17 years. For fucking terrorist threats? Yep. Holy fuck, dude. And uh, I remember in the courtroom, it was weird. It was weird because, like, I remember, like, in the courtroom, like, everything we asked for, like, our... Um, my medical records, all this stuff, they kept on denying it, denying it, denying it. And my lawyer was like, well, I think my client is unfit, you know, for trial. So they did, you know, a mental review and they found that I was like fit or whatever, you know, 
they changed the judge. I got another lawyer, thank God, you know, because my parents, my parents ended up, you know, taking a loan out in which I had to pay back over time. It got to the point where the VA didn't want to give up the medical records. They ended up doing a, um, a bench warrant out for the chief of records because they requested my records and for the chief of records to show up with my medical records and they never showed up. So they did a bench warrant out. Not to that, the pressure that the VA was putting on the case, you know, they started dropping You know, they started like kind of backing away from it. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I'm kind of all over the place, but no, no. during that time, right. I ended up, um, posting bail. Bail was about $150,000. Uh-huh. And my lawyer, great guy, great guy. He told me like, Hey, you need to go somewhere outside the VA to be able to get the help you need. And the place I went to was the Beacon House. And I heard of that place uh, from other veterans. He said, look, I was just like you. I was just like you. And I called them and they asked me like, well, are you willing? Like, you know, are you willing to change? You know, I was like, yeah. Are you willing to be sober? Yeah. You know, and it's essentially like a rehab, you know? And it gets, it gets even better because I go there and like, I was just surrounded with nothing but love and just like these everyone understood and it wasn't just like military guys it was everybody Mm -hmm. everybody and they seen the medications i was on they're like man like you don't need to be on these but if you want to be on be on them that's on you Mm -hmm. and after being there for about a month i was like look i want to transition off my medication slowly and they're like go for it because they want they wanted me to feel the feelings and learn how to process through them and get through those feelings learn how to cope learn how to get through them you know in a healthy manner right and so after about month three, I was completely off my medications. I was able to see life a little bit, a little bit differently. And through doing like step work and therapy with um, a great doctor, her name is uh, Mary Cook. And I was, I'm also surrounded with a bunch of people who are just like me, you know? And like, I thought like, oh, cause I'm in the military, you know, my, you know, my depression, PTSD and all this is completely like separate from any, anyone else's. You know, but I remember sitting there, sitting there with another guy, let's call him Mike. Mike was telling me about how, when he was in high school, his dad would pimp him out to other people in the trailer park and where he got raped. And I'm like, looking back at it and I'm like, damn, but my issues are nothing compared to this. Imagine being fucking 14, 15 years old, but I'm seeing where he's at and he has been past that, you know, and processed through his life. And I'm just seeing someone who just, when you look at something, they're just glowing. I'm just like positivity and just happiness and everything else. I'm like, fuck man, that's where I want to be. So after being there and doing therapy for a year, man. And like during the time we're like volunteering, going to Watts, cleaning alleys, redoing the library in Watts, doing all kinds of different community service stuff, you know? And I found a huge love of it because like being able to see like the positivity, the positive ripple effect in people's lives of what, you know, what I'm doing to be able to help, you know, it was amazing to see it in turn. It's kind of hard to feel like crap after doing something positive for other people. It's like, man, I feel at peace. My life is not so, so bad. You know, I'm actually being productive. You know, all those feelings that I was feeling prior, like I messed up my life, all this stuff, all it was was a bump in the road and it was a learning something I, I, I would have to learn from, learn not to do, or, you know, do more of, you know, I did some positive things. I did some negative things and remove the negative. And by me removing that neg- those negative things, I'm surrounded by people who've been through it who are able to point out those those flaws. Be like, hey, you're doing X, Y, and Z. You know, you know, oh, well, what do I need to be different? We'll do this instead. You know, and learning how to build certain positive characteristics, you know, I guess within my character. But when I was there, my mentor was a Marine vet. And he had gone through a lot himself, you know, and I'm listening to his story. And it was very similar. You know, and he spent like a little over eight years, you know, and I'm saying where he's at in his life and I wanted it. Mm. So the best thing, it was like boot camp, but for my life. Yeah. You know, like literally just tearing me down and then rebuilding and let's process through all these things. Let's go through them. Let's talk about it. You know, let's open up these wounds, but also like sew them back up and give you the right medicine you know, to combat these feelings as they come up. Cause it doesn't, all that just doesn't go away. But yeah. when I'm armed with certain, you know, certain things like the here and now, you know, like facts versus feelings, you know, 
this knowing like, oh shit, I feel like a shit bag. That's a feeling. But what are the facts? I'm going to school. I'm not in jail. I have a beautiful girlfriend. I, you know, like I'm not fucking homeless. Looking at all these positive things rather than, you know, holding on to the negative. It's like, you know what? My life is good. It could always be worse. And just yeah. being grateful, being grateful for what I have. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so you went, you did a year in that? In the... I did a year and then another six months. Um, I wanted to become a counselor, but it was for mental health sake. It's very hard. And I, my hats are off to people in that occupation yeah. because I understand it's very hard because like when people are addicts or dealing with like mental health issues or whatnot, and they go out and they end up dying and everything or committing suicide, overdosing, or, you know, dying from a detox, alcohol detox or what yeah. have you. But to kind of backtrack, one of the doctors, like the mental health aspect of the VA needs a lot of help, mm -hmm. you know, but when it comes to prosthetics or like physical therapy and a lot of, a lot of things like that, they're doing like great things. But as for the mental health aspect, no. Like um, one of the one of the main doctors of the psych ward, Dr. Manjaris, I remember him showing up and said that I'm unrecoverable, and I'm a threat to society, and that I'm dangerous, mm. you know, to myself and others, and I need to be put away. But that's just one doctor. Does his opinion even fucking matter? Because he can't, because he can't actually help somebody. It's like, you know what? Fuck him. Let him go to jail. No. Yeah. No. We're going to help him and find a way to help him. You know, how come the Beacon House with no medications and just therapy and love and being surrounded by other people who've been through the same thing, I was able to get through those issues. But this one doctor who's just pushing medications, if he can't help you, all right, screw you. Um, so what do you do now? It seems like you pulled yourself out. It seems like you're doing well. You got you got you got a color guard shirt on. I know you're part of the color guard team with American Legion. Yeah. So earlier uh, when I mentioned like volunteering, and mm -hmm. um, I used to volunteer uh, uh, Rising Tide uh, in Long Beach, which is an organization that helps inner city kids, like doing tutoring, mentoring, or not. But since I no longer live in Long Beach, it's a long drive, um, and I'm currently going to school full time. Um, I can't be able to make that commitment, but the commitment I can make is being part of the honor guard and color guard at the um, American Legion. That's awesome. And being surrounded by, you know, brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. you know, who who want to do nothing but help each other and render respect and courtesies to those who actually serve this country when they pass away. And it also provides a lot of um, healing and closure to the families. And I was told about it, and I volunteered to do it, and I was kind of like, well, you know, what kind of difference am I making? You know, and after about the second one, I remember being with uh, Brian Fleming and this lady, older lady came up to us and said, thank you very much. You did this for my husband a year ago. I provided a lot of closure and, you know, a lot of, a lot of things with my family and just seeing the respect and love that the military has, you know, for our servicemen. But the thing is, um, I mean, about a year ago, a good friend of mine, he passed away to, due to COVID at 33 years old. And I served with him in Afghanistan. And uh, I made my way. I was, it was during finals time, too. Mm -hmm. I emailed my teachers and, like, at the time, I didn't give a shit. I'm going to be there, you know? And flew out there and showed up uh, for the funeral. And all they did was show up with a boombox and a pre folded flag. And they just. Pressed the button, played taps, handed the flag, saluted, said, said, said the spiel, and left. Whereas, you know, the honor guard, we actually do like the seven gun salute, very ceremonial, and just actually showing, you know, like, hey, we're there, and just showing, like, you know, we're here to render the proper courtesies that you truly deserve, you know, yeah. serving the country and serving your time and sacrificing so much of your time and life, you know, and even like time with your family, other things that you've been through or, you know, body parts, whatever, you know, and just like, just show appreciation and love to another brother or sister. That was powerful, man. You know, Listening to that 21 gun salute, you know, uh, yeah, those, uh, those funerals are just, they're real, real powerful, man. Uh, it's a good thing what you, what you do on a color guard. Um, you know, I've talked, I listened to, you know, obviously at the general meetings and stuff like that, what you guys do, where you guys go. Um, 
and how you guys show up for these service members uh funerals is amazing mm -hmm. uh it's it's absolutely amazing i i truly enjoy it um and i i, I can i want to do it as long as long as i can because there's a wide mix of veterans you know from yeah. in korea vietnam desert storm you know iraq afghanistan mm -hmm. i mean grenada like yeah yeah so it's, it's nice to be surrounded by them any last words maybe to veterans that maybe find themselves in your shoes because there are definitely a lot of veterans that uh right now as we're sitting here doing this going through exactly what you described you know uh during this interview man what would you say to them don't let your past dictate your future love yourself call someone don't be embarrassed because i've had friends who committed suicide and i know how it feels to lose and also be in that same position and you're going to hurt a lot of people and you're well worth it reach out to a brother or sister i mean you could you could reach out on this podcast and I'll, I'll i'll give you my number and we'll even talk like your life is well worth it this is not the end of the road and without making mistakes there's no way to be able to get progression in your life and mm -hmm. so you know like i've literally i thought i royally screwed up my life but the beautiful thing is there's all when you're hitting rock bottom there's only the only way to go is out essentially you know mm -hmm. so yeah just love yourself reach out if you really need help Thanks, Travis. Appreciate you being here, brother. Yeah, I got bad thoughts that make my mind scared. Hold me hostage and they don't fight fair. Who gon' pray for me and wipe on my tears? Who gon' save me if you not right here? Move this darkness and make my sight clear. Take me your way, cause I don't like here. Ghost of my past, they feeling the night air. Wake me up, I'm trapped in my nightmares.